And in the previous khutbah, we spoke about the importance of knowing about Dajjal. Where Prophet Muhammad وسلم, stressed this knowledge, so much so that he added it as a dua at the end of our daily prayers. And the Sahaba said that he used to teach us this dua the way that he taught a verse from the Quran. Meaning that this is not something minor, insignificant, in passing. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned it. This is something he stressed. And as we said in the previous khutbah, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had said that it would be the most difficult, the most horrendous trial that humankind would face from the time of the creation of Adam until the end of the world. So we looked at who this individual was. And we clarified in those descriptions given by the Prophet ﷺ that a Dajjal was a man, was an individual. And he cannot be reinterpreted as some have done today. You can find on the internet those who claim that a Dajjal is the United Kingdom, Britain, as the Protestants back in the 15th century claimed that Ad Dajjal was the Pope, the head of the Catholics. Ad Dajjal is a particular human being. At least the Christians got it right, he was a man. May have been the wrong man, but at least they had it clear that it was a man. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu after describing the features of his face, his neck, his build, how he would walk, all of these different things, he went on to say, that there is a particular individual amongst them by the name uh, of Abdul Uzza ibn Qatan, who was from, was identified from the Mustalaq clan of the Khuza'a tribe in pre Islamic times. He was known to the people. That's who Dajjal most looks like. And in his own time, in Medina, there was an individual by the name of Ibn Sayyad, a man, Ibn Sayyad. Word spread in Medina that he was able to read people's minds. This is recorded in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. He was able to read people's minds. And the Prophet ﷺ set off with Umar ibn al-Khattab to go and meet him. And he asked him to read what was in his mind. And he said, Ad-Dukh, Ad-Dukh, Prophet ﷺ had in his mind a dukhan He got a piece of it indicating that he was obviously working with what we might call supernatural forces. But we know those supernatural forces are the forces of the jinn. And when the Prophet ﷺ from that confirmed that he wasn't in fact Dajjal, but the suspicion lay in the mind of Umar ibn al-Khattab Omar asked permission to go and kill him. And the Prophet ﷺ had said, 
If he was a Dajjal, you wouldn't be able to kill him. And if he wasn't, then I would be known as killing my followers. Because he was among the people of Medina who was supposed to have been a Muslim. Or killing the people of Medina. Again, this was a human being. The Prophet ﷺ confirmed that he wasn't in fact a Dajjal. If a Dajjal was not a person, then this would not have been an issue talked about at all. After this, one of the companions by the name of Tamim Ad-Dari, who was a former Christian who converted to Islam, who had set off on a ship with other companions to the east, the Far East. And the ship became shipwrecked on an island. And he had an experience there on the island. When he came back, they eventually were able to repair their ship and they came back to uh, Medina. He came to the Prophet ﷺ and he told him what he experienced there on this island. And the Prophet ﷺ had an announcement made in Medina in which he called the people to the masjid. And after he finished praying, he stood up before them and he introduced them to Tamim Ad-Dari told them about him and had him relate his experience. This is authentic tradition of the Prophet ﷺ. He goes on to explain, and this is found in Sahih Muslim, that they had uh, gone into the island after they were shipwrecked and they came across a beast that was covered in hair. And they couldn't determine from the hairiness of the beast which was its head and which was its backside. Couldn't figure it out. They looked the same. That's how it was described. And it spoke to them. They spoke to it. It identified itself as Al Jassas. And it told them about someone in a monastery that is waiting for them. So they went, taking all the precautions, assuming that this is something devilish, evil. They came into the monastery and they found there a man who met the description that the Prophet ﷺ gave of a Dajjal. And he was chained, arms chained to his neck, feet shackled. And he asked them questions. They answered, explaining who they were, where they came from, etc. And in the end, when they asked him, so who are you? He said, I am. At Dajjal, and a time will come not too long from now when I will be free. Now, Tamim Ad Dari hadn't heard the description that the Prophet ﷺ had given of Dajjal. This is why the Prophet ﷺ brought him. He was a convert to Islam, he hadn't heard the descriptions. So he had him say to them what they saw, what they experienced. Because this was confirmation in the, to the people, not that anybody would disbelieve Prophet Muhammad anyway, right? But it was just further confirmation of Dajjal and the information that he is already present in the world. But like the Gog and the Magog, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they are not known to people where they are exactly is unknown. The time of their release 
is with Allah, he is chained. And his time would come. This is the information that the Prophet ﷺ gave us. Some people would ask, how is it that he, is a, he was already in the world in the time of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ 1,400 years ago? How long did Prophet Nuh live for? How long has Satan, Iblis, been living? We can't argue or discuss about how it is that he could be living for so long. How it is that Prophet Isa is still alive and will come back at the end of time. This is not our area to debate or to argue about or to try to interpret. What the Prophet ﷺ has told us on this matter is true. The hows of the matter is with Allah. There are so many other things that we don't know how. We don't need to get stuck on this one little thing. It's a big thing in the general sense of who Dajjal is, but the issue about him being present in the world even now is not a big issue. Now, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had informed us that he would appear at a particular time. And we spoke about that in the previous khutbah. When would a Dajjal appear? So that we would not have any confusion. No one would say he's appeared. He's doing his stuff in the world now. He's, you know, we're coming under the attack. The end of the world is coming. No, there would be three signs before his coming. We said the first sign was that one third of the earth for one year, rain would stop. The second sign is that in the second year, two thirds of the earth, there would be no rain. And the third sign is that in the third year, there would be a drought throughout the world. No rain would fall anywhere on the face of the earth. It might seem impossible to us now. But just remember that the Sahara Desert, the Gobi Desert, all these deserts were once lush with vegetation. They dig up in these areas, fossils of the dinosaurs and others in places that were deserts. Before these deserts weren't deserts, they were forests, rainforests. So if that can happen, then know that a time can come when no rain for one year would fall on the earth. That is the time. Following that, he would be released from the island and he would make his way to Iran and this is not a special da'wah against the Shiites or anything like this you know yes we know what Shiaism is and what it represents and the treacherous role it has played in the history of Islam Muslims and continues to play but the Prophet ﷺ had said specifically in a hadith narrated by Abu Bakr, found in a Tirmidhi, authentically narrated, in which he said, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ had said, Dajjal would appear from a land in the east called Khurasan. A land in the east called Khurasan. Khurasan is the name of the eastern province, northeastern province of Persia from the time of the Sassanids. Till today, northeastern province. In the past, it used to include parts of Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, but mainly Iran. Now it is encompassed in Iran. Iran divided up, divided it up into three provinces, north, south, and east. And 
It remains the place where he would first be announced. His presence known in the world. The Jal has appeared in Iran, Khorasan. And he will be accompanied, the Prophet ﷺ had said, by people whose faces look like flat, beaten iron. That's how he described it. From this description before, people had said in the 13th century that this was the Mongols. The Mongols, because the Mongols came from the east and they devastated the Muslim world. Massacred huge numbers, but it wasn't them. Furthermore, the Prophet ﷺ had said that he would make contact with the Muslim forces between Syria and Iraq. This is where his forces will have come together. Those following him would have come together and the beginning of the battle for the world would take place. The forces that he will be struggling against will be the forces of the Mahdi. And the story of the Mahdi, of course, is another true story. Again, our children know about Superman, Spider Man, and all the other men, but they don't know about the Mahdi. But that is another story. The point is that he would be one who Allah would raise up amongst the Muslim Ummah in that period, who would reunite the Muslim world and become the world leader of, Muslim, of the Muslim states, Muslim peoples. The Khalif, the Khilafah, or the Caliphate, would be revived at that point, the Mahdi. Anyway, his forces would come in conflict or in contact with those of Dajjal in the region between Iraq and Syria. Among the followers of Dajjal, Prophet Muhammad had mentioned that when he appeared in, or when he appears in uh, Iran, in Khorasan, 70,000 Jews of Isfahan wearing their ritual shawls would follow him, would join his forces. But it's not to say that they represented the totality of his forces. Others will join him from all around the world. Muslims will join his forces. Isfahan, for those of you that don't know it, is the capital of Isfahan province in Iran, about 340 kilometers south of Tehran, the capital of Iran today. And it was once one of the greatest cities on the earth. It's known. A major city. Now it doesn't have much significance to most of the world. But at one time, it was a great city. He would, from those initial conflicts with Muslim forces, defeat those forces. And he would spread his control his reign over much of the known world. What we know of the world today, much of it would be under his control. And we said that when he appeared, he would appear after this period of drought and he will have with him a mountain of bread and a mountain of meat which would follow him. Two mountains would follow him. Of course, in your mind, you're trying to figure out how mountains are going to follow him. Don't go into the house. Leave the house to Allah. But a mountain of bread and meat would follow him.
Remember, he's coming at the time of mass starvation across the earth. He will call people to believe in him. Believe in him as what? As a prophet? No. We said he would be calling them to believe in him as God, as Allah. To accept him as their Lord. Now, historically we've had people do this before I mentioned. In New York City, we had Father Divine, who claimed he was God. He fed the poor during the Depression. In South India, we had Sai Baba, who claimed he was God incarnate. He fed the poor, set up hospitals, benefited people. So we have had people at different points who claimed that they were God, but their claims could not affect the world. It may have affected the people of that region who were desperate and poor so that a number of them may follow them, but they didn't affect the world. It would be nothing compared to the trial of Dajjal. You have world starvation. And those people who accept his call and believe in him he will command the sky to rain for them and it would begin to rain and the earth would bear fruit and for those who still held out rejected him when he left their area the next morning whatever they had stored up wealth to buy food etc would all be gone wherever he went or he goes he will command the earth to bring, up forth, bring forth its treasures, the gold, the silver, whatever wealth lay beneath the surface of the earth would come out and it would follow him. And the Prophet Sallallahu had said he would go across the earth from one end to the other, north, south, east, west, like wind-driven rain, entering all the cities of the earth. And he warned us, that if we hear that he is coming, not to think that we could stand before him, that we are going to resist him, but to flee. At that time, if we hear he's coming, flee. Don't wait around, think that you can gather some people together and kill him or whatever. Run for your lives. I ask Allah SWT to protect us in this time to come. That if it occurs whilst we are living, that we take the advice of the Prophet SAW and flee from our, for our lives. That he make a way for us at that time to escape his trial. And that we are able to, be, to remain firm on our faith, on our knowledge of who he is, on our knowledge of who Allah is and to remain steadfast in our worship of Allah at that great trial and tribulation. أقول قول هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. If you made it to the end of the video, please like the video as a sadka jariya so more and more people can watch it and you will get sawab for whoever watches it. We don't earn money from YouTube ads so you can support our channel from the link in the description so we can keep making new videos and you can subscribe to our channel. Jazakallah.